Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. Matt, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me a little bit today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Eric. Man, right right when we were about to hit record, we were we were talking a little bit and kind of started diving right into um, kind of influences, things that got you started in your music career. And it's one of the things I like to talk about most. You know, I always talk about there's filmmakers that make films and then there's films that make those filmmakers. And, um, you know, as much as I love watching a Tarantino, I like to watch the movies that Tarantino liked watching or as much as I like watching a Spielberg. I like going back and watching what are the things that inspired him as a filmmaker. And so before we get into Matt's journey, you know, now take me back to like childhood, Matt, like what movies were you watching? What, um, you know, what stood out to you and what kind of formed that, that DNA early on? Wow. Okay. Uh, childhood, Matt, um, childhood, Matt freaked his parents out because, uh, childhood Matt really liked classical music and, um, you know, would just sort of conduct. Hmm. I had these videos of like, um, I think I had like a Leonard Bernstein, uh, Leonard Bernstein. Uh, uh, I had a concert, like his 80th birthday hosted mm. by Beverly Hills. And I would watch that as a kid. And I think I had some videos of Seji Ozawa conducting too. Um, and I didn't have a lot of friends, uh, when I was very, very young. Um, uh, you know, and I would pretend all of my toys were, were musical instruments. Um, so much so that my parents, um, big shout out to them for, you know, everything. Uh, my parents got me, when they got me, you know, weapons, to, toy weapons to play with mm -hmm. as a child. Like we're not, we're not a pro, we're not a violent pro weapon household. Yeah. By <laughs> when they got me like toy weapons, I would pretend that they were weapons and they were overjoyed. They were just sort of like, oh good, he's not. He's it's not, not a trumpet, you know. <laughs> he's, yeah, he's not making these into into instruments. But I remember pretending like my little Fisher Price uh, shovel uh, with the yellow handle and the red um, the red shovel part was mm -hmm. a cello, um, you know. But that's I've always that's all to say I've always been obsessed with music yeah. um, since a very very early age. Um, I I did violin lessons when I was four, and it didn't really take. I didn't enjoy it. Mm. And so after less than a year of lessons, I said to my violin teacher, this will be my last lesson. Cause I, I didn't really know how to say, I don't like this. Yeah. Um, I said it, but my folks, uh, my folks were just like, well, if he says it's his last lesson, it's his last lesson. Mm. Um, I, I got sort of, um, I, I wound up picking up my, my dad started teaching me piano a couple years later and I stuck with it. And I'm glad I, I'm glad I played, but it wasn't the instrument for me, but with the instrument right. for me, was bass. Hmm. Um, and I picked up an electric bass when I was 12 and picked up an upright bass when I was 14 and I never stopped playing. Yeah. If I, I, if I know anything about composition, it's because I'm a bass player because, um, being a bass player, you're sort of the anchor of the harmony. You glue it to the rhythm you have a really unique opportunity as a bass player to live inside the music. Hmm. And I lived in, I've lived inside a lot of different kinds of music. Um, I've been able to take it apart. I've been able to see how it's, see how it's made from the inside out at orchestra rehearsals when I was a kid. And when I was in college, I would really listen to see to, I would listen to the, I would listen to when the conductor would rehearse different sections, not necessarily the melody, but the harmonies and mm. the different rhythms and see how it all kind of fit together. And then when I got to, when I got to college, I was a performance major, but I wanted to, I wanted to do something a little bit different. I entered as a jazz performance major, but I love so many different kinds of music. I mean, when I was, I played my, I've been playing bars since I was 16. Oh, I, wow. I, yeah. Um, played the triple rock, which was this club owned by, um, the guys in Dillinger four, apparently they had, um, there were some days where they would have unlimited baskets of bacon, but, um, I never, that was always, that was always kind of a myth. I never, I never witnessed that. <laughs> anyway, I, that's all, you know, I was an omnivore when I got to, I, I've always been a musical omnivore and I didn't want to stick to one thing. Yeah. So I convinced the, 
I convinced the conservatory that I went to, Oberlin Conservatory in Ohio, to let me sort of take a broader view of the kind of musical voice that I wanted to craft mm-hmm. for myself. And a big part of that was writing a film score because I've always been interested in mm-hmm. the music that makes movies. When I was, when did The Sixth Sense come out? 99? Yeah, so, I would say yeah, like 97, so was, 99, somewhere in there. Yeah, I was 11 or 12, mm-hmm. and I saw it in theaters, and it kept me up for two weeks straight. <laughs> um, and a large part of that had to do with the score. You know, the mm-hmm. moment before, before Cole saw a ghost mm-hmm. um, was this sort of haunting, buzzing. It almost sounded like bees. Yeah. There was something just totally alien that I couldn't get a foothold into, and I knew something was coming. I knew what it was, but I didn't know the particulars. So I would sort of psych myself out. And then when the jump scare would come, you know, I was already pretty, pretty wound up. Right. Right. Um, and I, it stayed, that feeling really stayed with me hmm. and it's never left. Yeah. 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 It's, I was listening to you on a, another interview somewhere. Like I kind of was yeah. Uh, and, and there were, you were talking a little bit about music and sound design and, uh, you know, cinematography and like how it all is just kind of this piece of a puzzle, you know? And it was interesting because I'm, uh, I took piano for several years. I don't know any piano now. Like yeah. I, it was, it was like banging my head against the wall, you know? Yeah. And, um, finally my piano teacher was like, I don't think that you're going to get this, <laughs> you know, it was like, I don't, I think you should try pursuing things that you are passionate about and and can succeed in. And, um, but it's interesting hearing you talk about all these different instruments and picking apart an orchestra. And like, I know for me, I relate to that in terms of film. Like I, I've, I'll watch something and pick apart the music, the cinematography, like how these things all work together. Um, and coming from a musical background, like when you would watch these films, did you catch yourself only tuning into the music or being taken out by the music or were you able to experience movies just as a whole, you know, like take it all for what it is versus just focusing on, you know, say the score. I think I was always, I was always able to take everything as a whole. That Mm -hmm. was, that was never super difficult. I could, I mean, music could make or break a music can make or break a scene, obviously. Yeah, right. But um, oftentimes, I would, you know, I would focus on the music that made the that made the scenes. Mm. Um, when I watch, like the we talked about Quentin Tarantino a little bit, um, or you mentioned you mentioned Tarantino, and um, when I saw Pulp Fiction, what made that movie for me was the music. Yeah, and, but. I got the soundtrack because the movie was so good Mm -hmm. because it made me think of the movie. I I remember listening on repeat to lonesome town, Mm -hmm. the Ricky Nelson song. Yeah. It's just so, so sad. And for some reason that made it onto the soundtrack and it it worked, Right, but it made me think of Pulp Fiction. You know, it's, it's all, um, it's all kind of, it's, you know, it goes back. Forth. and the kill bill soundtrack was an even bigger thing i would listen yeah. to the isaac hayes the isaac hayes track on that um i think it's when she's doing it there's a training montage mm-hmm. or something yeah i would listen to that and think of the training montage when i would drive but i would also you know it wouldn't take me wouldn't take me out of my it was, i didn't imagine it so much that i'd lose myself in it but it was just a nice association i had sure yeah well, well you mentioned before we hit record you were talking about scores and soundtrack. And I think, you know, because I'm not a musical prodigy, you know, sometimes I get intimidated. I'm most intimidated when I sit down with with people that work with music because I'm always like, I don't know this technical term for this. But um I always go back to to story, big movie moments that we associate with music, like what we're discussing. And I think when you think composer, your instant thoughts are like John Williams, Superman, you think of star Wars, you think of, and it's so funny because most of the tracks you think of are all John Will- Like you think of all these massive, you know, blockbuster scores. Um, you know, you were saying you weren't, you, you love those, you were drawn to those, but you liked some of these stranger kind of indie soundtracks and scores. 
what was it about some of those, like say John Carpenter that really stood out to you and drew you to them more than these massive orchestras doing the Superman theme or, you know, the star Wars soundtrack or something along those lines. That's a great question. Um, John Carpenter. I mean, I, I, John Carpenter, I, I, I'm a fan of John Carpenter, but I think more, there are other composers that are sort of cut from this cloth that had a bigger impact on me. Um, you know, Ennio Morricone before he did, before he did those, you know, the mission or whatever, right. he did a string of Dario Argento movies, yeah. like early ones. And I love those. I think there's something, there's something so adventurous about what he does. Yeah. Um, but it's still melodic. Mm-hmm. The the bird with the crystal plumage kind of made me, it was one of the things that um, made me want to move out here. Just mm. uh, was one of the scores that made me want to move out here because it, um, it's so integral to the movie and it's so all over the place, Yeah, just like the movie, but it does it in a way that doesn't feel safe. Yeah. I grew up playing in punk bands, so I like music that doesn't feel safe. Right. I like music that, um, that challenges you, but you still want to sing along with it. Mm. Um, the, the other thing, the other soundtrack that I always had in my mind, or one of the other soundtracks I always had in my mind was Cliff Martinez's score to drive. Mm. Now that's not a safe soundtrack because in the hands of so many people that could have been just this pounding, right. percussive orchestral heavy action score. And what does he do? He uses something called a crystal bichet, which is a, um, or a bichet crystal to score it, which is essentially a, a descendant of the glass harmonica, hmm. which is this rotating glass cone. You, you know, you know what it is, hmm. right? I yeah. don't. <laughs> it's a, it's a glass instrument that you rub to make sounds. And so it has this kind of sound. So instead of becoming, instead of becoming a movie, you know, instead of becoming this sort of taut action thriller, Drive also has this dimension of tenderness to it. Yeah. Um, and I liked that. I mean, I loved the sound palette, first of all, because it was just so alien at right. the time. I heard anything like it. But I also liked um, that it added a sort of, mon- it added a different dimension to the movie. Um, so, it has this, it, ha- it has this kind of sympathetic undercurrent to it. Yeah. You really, you really feel for the driver and, you know, whenever in, in that scene where he says to, um, he says to that character, like, if you don't tell me, if you don't give me this information or, you know, you're going to leave a, you know, you left a little boy without a father, I'm going to hurt you. Something like you really feel, you really think that he's, he cares for this kid. Right. I'm probably misrem- misremembering parts of it but the point is that character um the score kind of imbues that character who's just sort of um you know ryan gosling's performance is so restrained and so minimal it it really adds some emotional weight to it right um i just looked up a crystal bichet and i'm like yeah never seen this before in my life yeah it's it's very odd yeah can you can you describe it uh I mean, it is like a, it's, it looks alien. I mean, it looks like a, a strange, yeah. um, I, it's like three discs and a interesting pair. It's huge too. Yeah. Which is bizarre. Cause you look at the picture. I mean, it looks like a piece of modern art, <laughs> but it's yeah. an instrument. I suppose I wouldn't even yeah. know how to approach it. Yeah. Um, Another movie that, another movie that I really liked was Clute. The hmm. uh, another score that I liked. It's Alan J. Pacula. It's part of the his Paranoia trilogy with all the President's Men. Hmm. Um, and the music for that, the music for that feels. The, there's a theme for that. The theme yeah. song is just eerie and terrifying. Yeah. Um, but in such a subtle way, it doesn't it's not music that beats you over the head with what it's supposed to be. It just sort of gently nudges you to your interpretation of what the, what the movie should be. Do you ever um, like music that beats you over the head? 
and says, yeah. here I am. I love it. <laughs> because love it. I, you were mentioning, you know, driving, you were mentioning, I mean, you mentioned Maricone, which I, I, a lot of Maricone scores, like, I mean, Once Upon a Time in the yeah. West is one of my favorite movies of all time. And the score is almost a horror movie score in some of the mm-hmm. scenes. And it is very much a horror movie in a lot of scenes. Um, but in it, and then you see like Hateful Eight in 2015, like he's coming back and doing another version of that, I feel like. Yeah, even better, I would say. Um, but then you have scores like you mentioned, kind of the drama, like Pino Dinaggio score and Blowout that has this like very melodramatic, almost like. And De Palma has this too. It's so melodramatic where like he teeter totters to where it could be just way over the over the top to where it yep. loses you, but it never does. Um, I I have a special place in my heart, I guess, for scores like that that are like so like the love song in that in that movie is and um tarantino actually used it in death proof but like it's so melodramatic and so look at me that mm-hmm. it's like it becomes its own thing like its own scene is like this yeah. this score that comes in so i was curious if you like that or if you found it distracting oh i love it mm. it's so fun i mean jaws i think is my yeah. favorite name that's a character that's a legit character, a character in the movie yeah right yeah um, the Star Wars scores, I mean, those are, yeah. those are unacceptable. Right. Um, Alan Silvestri's scores to the scores to the Avengers movies, hmm. I think are just brilliant. Yeah. And they're so not subtle. Right. Um, but they're so well done. Yeah. I, I, those are, that was my favorite part of Avengers Infinity War, which my hot take is the saga should have ended after Infinity War. Mm-hmm. There shouldn't have been an end game. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> that, just leave it dark. Been, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just half of the characters are dead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It would be, it would be that, interesting. That's um, why I make these decisions though. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, um, yeah. I'm I, the new saw movies coming out and um, oh, it yeah. looks like I'll be talking to Charlie Clouser. It'll be awkward if I don't. And I mentioned this, but like, you know, the big reveal is like, pinned with this score that just ramps up and ramps up and ramps up to where it, it's blowing your mind as this twist that by you know movie six there's like six twists on top of each other <laughs> layered in yeah. so the score just keeps going and going but yeah there's there's so many iconic films where like those moments are so underlined by some you know some piece of music um yeah. in uh, yeah. oh sorry go ahead oh no you you go ahead um well, I, I was going to say, you know, going into into Bell, which I hope this isn't too too much of an abrupt, uh, you know, <laughs> kind of uh, drive into it. But, um, you know, when I got reached out to cover it and I read like Beauty and the Beast, you know, take and I almost responded just instantly and was like, no, not interested, you know, <laughs> like, um, yeah. You know, I know the story, you know, which I think is actually some something like the tagline of the movie is like the tale is old as time. They kind of riff on that a little bit. Um, yeah. But I went and watched the trailer because I've had a couple of times I've been reached out with a, a movie to cover or to talk about. And I go, no. And then I watch the trailer and I'm like, yes, let's let's do it. And this was one of those projects where I hear being the beast. I'm like, we, we all know the story. We know this. And I go watch the trailer and I see the cinematography makes it look more like, you know, the Northmen than Disney, you know, and the music is, is not this fantastical storybook music that we may associate with the Disney property or musicals that we've seen or, or the CW productions that we've seen. And um, it, it's one of those things though, where it's such an iconic story. The Disney movie occupies so much of pop culture even people that have done their own takes borrow so heavily that it all feels connected going into something like that. How, how much are you drawn to go? Let's look at these iconic things that have been done before and riff on them versus let's go. Like, where do you even start? Like, do you start with just like blank slate? Let me block out everything I already know. Or is it, how do I pay homage to what's been done while also giving it its completely own direction? Um, I, I mean, going into this project, I understood that it wasn't going to be like the Disney version. Yeah. Uh, we yeah. all understand that. Sure. Um, I think it's a, you know, coming from a place where I'd read the script and I'd read drafts of the script, 
I think it's a love. It's a story about love first. Mm. It's a take on Beauty and the Beast second. Um, Beauty and the Beast is just a. It's the most effective vehicle for the story that Max wanted to tell. Mm. Um, yeah, I didn't. I never go. In, I tried not to go into a, any movie that I work on um, with any notions. I try to go in totally unassuming. I try to go in with a blank slate. Um, I. I just try to, I, I try to go in assuming that like there's a story that we want to tell that hasn't been told in the way that we quite in the way that we want to tell it. And it's my job to help tell it. So, mm. um, yeah, I mean the Disney thing never, never really figured into how we wanted to tell it. If anything, more of an influence was the Cocteau version. Mm. There are some moments that I, I don't want to get too heavily into spoilers, but there are some moments where we, um, we we did we did some things filmically that more resemble the Cocteau version than yeah. than anything. Um, but yeah, I mean, as far as my score, I didn't feel any sort of pressure to do um, to do anything like Beauty and the Beast, the the Disney movie. Right. I just wanted to, I just wanted to do something that felt like our movie. No, yeah. yeah. I've seen I've seen Beauty and the Beast so many times. Like as a kid, yeah. I grew up in the I grew up in the Disney clamshell case video cassette age so right. i had a copy i watched it a bunch at one point i could probably sing along with the whole thing yeah i i couldn't anymore it's been ages since i've seen it but it's in my marrow so yeah the movie itself does a good job of not trying to do what say say the horror version of way the pooh that came out recently that goes i have not seen it i've seen the see the trailer for it you know but it's clearly is trying to stick its fingers in the eye of the childhood story and go so far in the other direction into full on horror terror, you know, and really just, just like rip apart anything you already know. I feel like bell really balances that of like, we're going to go in a more scary adult horror direction while maintaining some of the things that are beautiful about the story Um, with the music. Did you was your initial inkling to go like how scary can we go or how far away from melodic and beautiful and sweet you know as people may come to expect? Well, my initial conversations with Max, um, the first score that he he showed me was the Ocarina of Time by Zelda. That was his interesting real reference because he, um he really loved that score. Um, he, he kind of saw, he sort of saw Bell's journey as being somewhat related. And I mean, mm -hmm. you know, this, this young woman moving through these kind of unreal landscapes, I think is probably fair to say. And so I listened to a lot of them. I listened through the score and um, that was my initial reference, but he also gave me a pretty long leash, yeah. um, so to speak. And when I went to Iceland to visit the set, which is something he strongly encouraged me to do, right. um, I did so with the understanding that my um, the Iceland that I sort of took home with me would make it into the score. So it was a lot of a lot of sort of more raw sounds, a lot of female vocals that I imagined doing these kind of crunchy harmonies. Like the I, when I got off the plane and took the bus to. Um, and took the bus to the town where I was staying, I was listening to the Bulgarian women's choir hmm. and Johan Johans and the Bulgarian women's choir is fantastic. And they've been on some Kate Bush records, um, the sensual world, hmm. most notably, that's probably my favorite Kate Bush record. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, beauty and the beast again, not, I didn't, yeah, didn't feel any, didn't feel any pressure to, didn't feel any pressure to make something sweet or horrific. I just wanted to make something authentic. Yeah. I mean, I, I was curious if you had gone to Iceland and visited the set because it does, the score feels so true to what you picture when you see this scenery and you, you know, it feels, um, it just feels to fit like a glove, you know, like it really, really works. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean Iceland. Speaking of characters in the movie, like Iceland is a character. Like visually, yeah. to, like 
to me, that's one of the selling points of the movie, I think is just like, look at this, like this feels otherworldly. Um, yeah. How, how long were you there? Like, did you, did you get to really spend a lot of time like watching the film come together? Like, or were you there for a couple of days, like trying to grab as much as you can before heading back? I was there for 10 or 12 days. I don't remember. Okay. Which. Wow. Um, I stayed I stayed at the at the place where a lot of our um, where, you know, some of our crew was staying just outside of Reykjavik. And I went to a couple of shoot days. So I went to the I went to Papa and Bell's house. Hmm. And my directive whenever I went to a shoot day was basically just we are a well oiled machine. Stay hidden. Hmm. And so I, I didn't exactly stay hidden, but I stayed out of everybody's way. I got lost in some woods a couple of times. I wandered up some mountains, um, found some, some little rivulets and waterfalls. There, there are so many, so many beautiful yeah. waterfalls in Iceland. So many beautiful things. You can't, you can't really turn around a full circle without spotting something otherworldly and beautiful. Um, but yeah, I, so I went to Papa's house and I went to beast cave hmm. and, I just hung out and I just recorded nature sounds and water sounds and wind sounds. Our sound recordist basically, I had this grand idea that I'd record nature sounds when I was there. Um, and Casey, our sound recordist was like, you know, most of it is, most of it is just wind and most mm. of it is empty space. So I did a lot of recording, but I also just did a lot of listening and it turns out, it turns out there's a lot of different kinds of wind hmm. it turns out there's a lot of different kinds of water um and the way the wind can move through the air in iceland is so different if you're listening closely enough uh than the way that the wind moves through the air in say los angeles where there's yeah. all kinds of you know car exhaust and particulate matter here it's all it's all geothermal out there hmm. so um it just feels so clean so much so that it was a shock to my system. Um, but that wind, um, the wind, the sound of the wind had a heavy influence on the score, the, um, the clarity, the space, it's all there. It feels like it fits like a glove. Like that's, that's all I can think to say about it. I mean, it really does feel, I, I feel that way. The way I do about the Northman, you know, when I watch that, like the music, in that complements that and it takes you back like you feel like you time traveled to a different period <laughs> like a hundred percent um yeah. you know going about it too like did you how much of it was you working through different instruments on your own did you have a team of people that were helping bring those sounds together um i know obviously you had some like vocals and things like did you have a lot at your disposal to be able to go let's let's really push this as far as we can um or was it let's keep this kind of minimal and and try to approach it in a really you know a really simpler you know kind of way i had um i had a mac pro, a 2013 mac pro some hard the answer i thought you were gonna say here <laughs> um an upright bass uh three two or three analog synths a digital synth um, and a living room. Yeah. And that's basically it later on in the process. Um, there was a, a violist and a trio of vocalists that I brought on to help sweeten the cues, but by and large, yeah. I did. And, um, the final suite, um, Max's dad, Mike, who, uh, was one of my first teachers ever, um, played the jazz bass solo. Hmm. But other than that, I did everything myself. I played all the other upright bass parts. I programmed everything. I arranged everything. Um, I made the patches on the synths. It's just me in my living room and mostly a, mostly a, a bathroom. Was it hard maintaining that? Because, I mean, I have to imagine coming back, you've got all this like magic you've tried to capture in a bottle of like, here's the environment. Like, then you're sitting in your living room and like have to go to work. Like, what, was it difficult maintaining that energy or that like, this is what I want it to feel like throughout the course of that project? Because I, I know like, there's a lot of times like I do shooting and editing and then I'll go film something yeah. and it's amazing. 
And then you sit down, you start looking at the footage and you're like, is this amazing? I don't know. And then it starts coming together. Like it's this very emotional kind of journey and process. Um, did it feel that way? Like you go to Iceland, it's this magical place. And then you have to come back and recreate this in your living room without a bunch of people to bounce off of, you know, through that process. Um, no, I, I enjoy the process of, of tinkering mm. and putting together a score. I did, we did about three drafts of the score, like, and it's around 65 minutes of music. So wow. a lot of music and it's an 80 minute movie, right? I mean, it's like, about, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if all 65 made it in. No. Um, I haven't like sat with the stopwatch and figured out how much it's, how much it's pretty wall to wall. I felt. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, which is intentional and which I, I appreciate. Um, but at one point the score, you know, at one point I did kind of get burnout. That's, that's the thing that, that was a real challenge. I love, normally I love tinkering. I love working, but I was doing all of this by myself in between March, 2020 and June, 2020. Yeah. And that was a time where there was a lot of, you could get out of the house and you could go hang out with oh, people yeah. and go, go relax and unwind. Yeah. Super, super chill time. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I think the, and it was hot, it yeah. was really, really hot and right. I can't work with the air conditioner on mm. my apartment because it picks up sounds. So, or because my mics will pick up the sound and it makes us, yeah. so it'll interfere with my ability to hear my mixes. Mm. So it was, there was a pandemic. Uh, there was, you know, there were, there were black people being, you know, being murdered by cops and we were mm -hmm. all seeing it in a way that I think was clicking. I mean, that's been going on for a long time, a very yeah. long, pretty long time there have been cops, but, um, I think it was hitting different for, for a lot of people right? because, because we were inside because we had more tools to capture it. Yeah. Um, we're forced to stop and yeah, look at whatever's put in front of us. Yeah. Yeah. And it was just, and on top of it, you know, usually I get, I get to be in a room with Max when we work on stuff, because we've worked on so many things, but we were working on, we were working on this movie and we were just emailing back and forth and having zoom calls. And there was latency with the, with the audio, because I don't think we had, dis I don't think I had discovered audio movers yet. Mm. Um, and it was just like, that was the hard part. The hard part, that was the part that really weighed on me. Just making a solitary massive score that I had to sound, I had to make sound massive by myself in my living room when the world was literally on fire mm. and there was a plague basically. Yeah, right. Um, <clears throat> and then one day, Max gave me some temp music and said, I want it to sound like this. And usually when I get temp music, I just you know, crumple it and throw it. <laughs> no, no, not at kidding. all. Um, yeah. I mean, some people do that, but not me. I love temp. Um, when you talked about wanting to see the movies that influenced Tarantino after mm. you see Tarantino's movies, A, I did that or I do that. And B, I do that with music. Mm. So when I get a piece of temp, I try to go as deep as I can. And then I try to go sideways and I try to, figure out what spawned that music so I can make yeah. something in dialogue with the temp so that it doesn't sound like a sound alike. Hmm. Um, yeah. Anyway, he gave me a piece of temp and I was reading about it and it was all hand built instruments. Hmm. Sound unrecognizable. And I was just like, man, what the fuck? Like I was so just put out by it. Um, Cause I was like, how am I going to do this? And then instant there was just sort of this thing that's it was like a switch that flipped and a big shift and it was like no i don't have to do this i get to do this yeah. i get to be the one to i get to i have a unique opportunity to be the architect of the sound for this movie yeah. to make it sound authentic and i'm a resourceful i think it's fair to say that i'm a resourceful person um you know and i can i should be able to figure this out right like, I've been recording my own stuff since I was, uh, since I was a kid, I've been playing in punk bands. I'm, you know, I'm used to being, a, am used to kind of being a little scrappy. Yeah. Um, and I was like, okay, like 
rolled up, rolled up my sleeves and I, I got to work and then there was, there was no looking back. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. I'm really grateful that I'm really grateful that I got that challenge to just like the sound, the instruments, do, the instruments don't exist, but the sound does come close to it in a way that, um, that makes sense for this movie. Yeah. I love that perspective. I've, I've talked to quite a few um, composers who hate temp music and they, you know, like they, and, and editors as well. Like I've talked to a lot of people that just despise temp music because it's either like, um, I talked to one guy, he's like, it's unfair because you're getting handed, like they tempted all with, you know, John Williams or, or <laughs> Eddie America. And then like all these people, yeah. it's like, I'm not them, you know, like this is, you know, how do I match that iconic score? That's everybody uses. Um, but then also I, I, I like your approach though, into what, where it's like, it's almost, Hey, you know, max through this temp music in here. Like, what did he like about that? Like what drew him to that piece of music? I think that's a super healthy reframe instead of being like, well, I'm not going to do that. You know, it's like, what did he like? Yeah. What were the pieces he liked? And, and I love that you used, you know, it, it sounds like you improvised a lot with sound effects and with things that you did record in person, which I think is a really cool, it, it gives it that handmade feel that like, yeah. again, makes the movie not feel like it doesn't feel like stock music. Cause I think when you think of any of these types of stories, you think of, you know, at least for me, I think of these very like just simple orchestral pieces of music that you just like, yeah, throw that on there. And then, you know, I was listening to the track. Thank you um, this morning oh. just to, to listen to again, which I think is my favorite of the tracks that have been released from it. Um, it, 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 it's a really beautiful piece of music. And again, it, it feels like it's from another time. Like it feels like it's a very, again, it feels like you time travel a little bit when you're listening to, to the music. Um, it's a, it's a beautiful piece of work. Um, but it has that quality where it feels like it wasn't made using modern means. <laughs> it's, it just has yeah. that otherworldly quality to it. So, um, it, I think it's interesting hearing it was music inspired by these handmade instruments you're traveling to Iceland, you're capturing stuff on location, like all of that amalgamates to this unique score, yeah. you know? Well, thank you. Out. I really, really appreciate that. Um, mm. I should say that the sounds themselves that I recorded did not make it into the score, but approximating the sounds and feelings <clears throat> right. is what my goal was. So the way I did that was, I mean, with synthesizers, you have a, a, a many synthesizers have a noise generator that you can, sort of you know you can add usually to add kind of a percussive a percussive hit or a percussive tinge mm -hmm. to a pad um and for this it adds a layer i i like the way that the noise generators can just add a layer of wind sounds which is yeah. another part. so every synth patch i designed my challenge to myself was there needs to be something that sounds like wind whether it's um you know, whether it's actually adding a noise generator or a noise tail, whether it was just sort of running the noise gen um, by itself and adjusting that sound, whether it was, you know, adjusting the resonance field. You know, there are any number of ways you can make something sound like there's wind blowing through it mm -hmm. on a synthesizer. And on the upright bass, um, it's you're creating motion when you draw the bow across the string, you're creating motion with the bow, hmm. you're creating motion with the string. So there is some, you know, there is some movement in the air. No. And um, the way that I kind you know, I tried to do a couple of things to make that sound windier too. So I would, I would loosen the bow hair on, on my strings to add a layer or on my bow um, to add a layer of grit and noise Mm -hmm. above the above the strings so that it almost sounds so that the sound was a little raspier so that it's not right. like there's escaping um there's another technique that i used um called artificial harmonics mm -hmm. which is essentially where you shorten the length of the string um and when you every string has like you know overtones right um if you ever played have you ever played a guitar no no if you touch certain points of the string, just touch it, not pressing down, the sound is a little higher. The sound is a lot higher. Um, mm -hmm. And that's because what you're doing is you're activating, um, you're activating the, the overtones of the, of the low string. 
So if you shorten the string length, those high notes become higher. So I really shorten the string. Um, and I would, you know, find other harmonics, mm. other, these other drones, um, and I would play them lightly so that it sounded like there's sort of this wind whistling through glass effect. Mm. Um, plus brass instruments for, for Papa, you know, those are literally wind tunnels, basically. Yeah. Con- for wind. So, um, everything I did and everything I did, I tried to add that feeling of different, I tried to add different kinds of wind like the different kinds of wind that I had heard and the reverbs that the reverbs that I added to, um, to all of the sounds, I think reflected the different kinds of space that I could hear. I could hear the emptiness sort of echoing in. Yeah. Um, Like, like the cave versus, you know, Bell's house versus outdoors versus, versus you know, field. Yeah. Versus a forest. Like I tried to create these sort of impossibly empty, impossible empty spaces. Mm. Yeah. yeah. You're a scientist is what I'm figuring out. <laughs> I don't know about that. I think I really like sounds. Yeah. I really, yeah. Like sounds and I really like making music. I mean, um, and I like flying by the seat of my pants, which at a certain point when what, I, what, I, one of the things I love about working with Max is when, when we find a, when we find a good sound, when we find a sound that works, we get really excited. Right. Yeah. Just try to, we just try to put it into, we just try to put it in wherever it works. We've done that on every every project we've worked on, every narrative project. If we discover a sound, we'll go back and figure out how do we use this to enhance the other cues right. so that it ties it to the movie and enhances the scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. Well, um, I definitely think anyone listening should check out Bell. And for me, I know like the the two biggest things that stood out to me were the music and the cinematography, like those two things. And I think anyone who watches the trailer that is sitting here going like, I don't want to watch a beauty and the beast tale, you know, like I already know this. It's just very different. You know, like I, I, I don't know. I don't know how to explain too much of that without giving it away. It's a very different take on it. Um, listen to the track. I'll link to that in the show notes. Like just listen to the first track of music that Thank you. is, is great. You know, um, before we, before I let you go, um, I have to ask you some questions. Ask everybody that comes on the show because I want to know your answers to them. Uh, we've got about nine minutes, so we'll try to get through these. Uh, but hopefully, they don't. Hopefully, they don't take too too long. Um, first and foremost, uh, if you had to program a double feature with Bell, uh, what would you pick and why? Oof. Jeez. Um... If I had to program a double feature with Bell, um, I think um, let's get weird with it. Let's go the juniper tree. Hmm. I've not seen that. I'm adding that to my list. Yeah. Um, it's another. It's another kind of Icelandic, Icelandic fairy tale. Very different and very very dark. And Bjork is in it. And um, the score to, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Bjork as an influence on the score. Um, I, I've i loved her music since I was a kid. Um, I've been fascinated with her since she showed up to the Oscars in that swan dress. <laughs> um, but Medulla is one of my favorite albums ever. And those vocal harmonies and vocal textures were a very big influence on the vocal harmonies and vocal textures in Bell. Mm. Um, and I think the tone, the tone of the juniper tree is, is a nice, is a nice fit. Okay. Yeah. I added it to my list. I have a, I always have my notes stock out with like questions and then now it's just kind of a list of like a billion movies that have been mentioned. I'm like, I got to check that out. Um, Right under beaches from 1988. Still got to watch that. I think that was a Berkeley Brady recommendation. <laughs> She's like, you got to yeah. watch beaches. Um, so yeah, is that with who's that with again? Um, oh mm-hmm. man, I'm gonna blank on her name. Uh, I wish I had Google right in front of me. Here we go. Um, uh, Bette Midler. Yeah, Bette Midler. Yeah, she re- she recommended I, that. I think yeah. that was her double feature recommendation between her movies. She's like, watch Beaches. It kind of sums up yeah. everything you need to know about me. Um, uh, who do you think is the most underrated artist working today? Uh, 
the most underrated artist in any any it can be in any facet um I mean, it could be it could be in music. It could be just a filmmaker that you love that you don't feel like is getting the attention they deserve. Um, any any underrated artist? Any underrated artist? Oh boy. Um, let's see. Uh, oh God, that's so tough. Um, I know if I know whatever I answer, I'm going to come up with like a million different ones later. Yeah. Um, but I, I guess I'll go. Um, I don't know. Maybe um, I'm just looking at my records right now. They're right behind you. I'm trying to think if there's anything, anything there. Um, I don't know. Cliff Martinez. I never, <clears throat> I don't hear his name as much as I, as much as I used to. Is he um, a composer? Composer. Yeah, what? Cliff Martinez. Oh, only God forgives. A, drive. He did Drive. Um, he did uh, the Neon Demon. I think. I think. I I gotta see that. I've I've. It's been on my list forever. I gotta I gotta cross Neon Demon off the yeah. list for sure. Yeah. He did Only God Forgives, which is a, a really good score. Hmm. Um. Yeah, I just I just think he's fantastic. Oh, I'll have to check him out. Um. What do you think is the this really really easy one? What is the best decade of film history? The best decade of film history. Um uh, best best by any metric or best best how? What, what what do you think is the best? You know, like I I my answer to this is always I kind of think it's it's kind of half decades. Like I always, my answer is always the reactionary half of a decade after a super sanitary half of a decade. So, you know, you've got the, well, I mean, look at the early two thousands and how dark and gritty that got. And then we shifted into the big budget superhero kind of, you know, a little bit more, you know, family blockbuster, and now we're kind of shifting into like you have Babylon and you have like this long list of movies that are starting to come out that are that are really aggressive and you know pushing boundaries a little bit. So um yeah. but I mean for me, like I my go-to is kind of always the 70s because I feel like it was such a reaction to <clears throat> the super clean 50s and a lot of the 60s. But again, it yeah. would be like the half decade of the latter half of the '60s has a lot of gold in it. So, um, but it can—it's all personal preference at the end of the day because there's great movies every decade. I mean, immediately, immediately coming to mind. I mean, it's—it depends on the day. Like you could, you could right. make the seven the '70s. I wouldn't argue with you. No. Um, I'm going to make the case right now for for the '80s. Yeah. Um, I'm mostly thinking about like the ways that synthesizers were used um, in film scores uh, and things like that. I think that's really important. Yeah. Uh, but far, as far as, you know, not, not even just important, it's just fun. I mean, aliens, that's a fun movie. Yeah. I really, really love that movie. Um, and like uh video mm-hmm. That's fun too. I mean, it's, it's gross, but it's yeah. fun. Yeah. Um, and then of course, Blade Runner, any decade that Blade Runner is part of is going to be, you know, yeah. Blade Runner is my favorite film score. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cr- um, yeah. Cronenberg Cron- movies are fun, but they're definitely a weird thing to say is fun. <laughs> like it's, yeah. It, but there, there is a lot of fun to be had in them. Um, I, I actually had never seen a Cronenberg movie till this year and started it was like one of those things where i was like it's getting inexcusable that like it's just been on my list so i started like watching through them and then watching the fly which is a really fun movie oh god Um, it's fun and uh and then you know moving into even uh recent projects i don't know why i'm blanking on the name um oh crimes of the future you know like watching that and just seeing the the kind of evolution of him as a filmmaker was really yeah. interesting, especially when we go yeah. back to like his first projects, like, you know, rabbit and, and how different, but how similar all of his work is over the last couple of decades. Yeah. Uh, the brew, the brew yeah. was great. I mean, Howard Shore is his go-to. Yeah. Composer. 
And Howard Shore, I mean, of course, Lord of the Rings. Like, right. Yeah. You know, that's a little that's project a, people probably yeah. know about, you know, yeah. Lord of the Rings. <laughs> I mean, talk about big budget scores that really do it for me. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Right. Yeah. I love that. Um, yeah. If you were given the green light to, I'll say rescore, if you were given the green light to remake any film, uh, what would you choose and why? Is there, a, is there a certain project that, you know, a sequel or a remake you'd love to tackle like a new take on? Oh God, so many. <laughs> I, I would love to, I would love to score. I mean, if there's ever, I would love, I would have loved to have scored one of the exorcist movies, hmm. you know? Um, that would have been really fun. I'm sure those are, I don't know who's doing them, but I'm stoked yeah, for, I don't, I don't uh, know who's doing the new one. Um, yeah. Or I, the, yeah, there's another thing that I don't know who's scoring, but I would have loved to have gotten that call. And yeah. of course I'm going to, uh, the three body problem. Hmm. Um, the books were fantastic. The six and Lou remembrance of earth's past sci-fi books and Netflix is making a series. I would have loved Loved, loved, loved to have done that. No, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm trying to see. Now I'm curious who's doing the Exorcist. Um, David Gordon Green. Well, he's directing. Yeah, um, I know he's directing. He brought in Jennifer Nettles, so Righteous Gemstones. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Crews rolling in. Uh, composer. I don't see the composer on IMDb. Interesting. Huh. I don't know. Well, it may be placements. I'm sorry? It may be placements. I know that for the original Exorcist, um, Lalo Schifrin originally wrote the score, but it was too scary. Um, That's such, such a funny critique. Um, yeah. It was too, it was just too evil sounding. And I know that they used a lot of placements. Like they used. I mean, have they heard tubular yeah. bells? That's like the most evil sounding soundtrack ever. But yeah, but even that was like that was on a record. That was on a record before The Exorcist. Right. Um, yeah, they just yeah used it. Like, yeah, interesting. Um, which of your projects do you think is the best representation of you as a creator? Um, that is a great question. So I love what asking when people are promoting a movie because they're always like, of course, this project <laughs> is it. But I'm always curious to know if there's like one that stands out that's like, you know, this is I, me. Um, I won't say that. I mean, I think Bell is as good a representative of any about my kind of idea about how the score should contribute to world building. Mm -hmm. um, because... I think the goal with Bell was to create this sort of unreal, the goal with the Bell score was to help tell the story, but to do it in a way that creates an unreal environment that could only fit that film. Um, I think that's kind of, that's something I always aim to do. And I got sort of the widest, I got sort of the most, uh, the most rope to, to work with. And, um, uh, I got the most music to write. I mean, 65 minutes of music is yeah. a lot of, music, so it was wall to wall. Um, I mean, my favorite scores are the ones that feel like they're coming from the world within the movie. Mm. I think Blade Runner is my favorite because it feels like it's coming from that world. Yeah. It feels like it doesn't feel like there's an orchestra commenting. It feels like the commentary is happening from inside the movie and it's mm. moving the movie. And I wanted that for, I wanted that for Bell. I want that for every movie, but I think it was especially uh, important for a, um, a movie like Bell that is a fantasy. Um, and I feel like I'm, I'm happy with, I'm really happy with what we got. And I feel like that's a good, I feel like it's a great, um, I think it, it pretty best rep, it best represents how I feel about world building. Yeah. And um, the lengths that I'll go to make it happen. No, absolutely. No, literally, to the ends. Of, I went to Iceland. <laughs> to the ends of the earth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I'll, yeah, yeah. I, I go. I, I wanted to go all in. I want to go all in with all of my scores, but this one, I, I really, really. It took me. You know, it took us a year to work on yeah. a trip to Iceland. We worked through a pandemic, a pivotal time in in history, and um, I just, I like going all in, and this yeah. was a life. 
Love that. Well, you may have inadvertently answered my next question, but what is the best piece of advice you would give to an aspiring filmmaker who's listening to this? Uh, don't listen to me. <laughs> I that thought you'd you say go all in. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but yeah, I mean, if you, I mean, I can tell you what's worked for me is just like listening to my, listening to the people that I collaborate with mm -hmm. um, and understanding that what I'm making is not, I'm not making concert music, yeah. you know, I'm film music. It's supposed to help tell a story with, with everybody else. You're, you're part of an ensemble. <clears throat> so what, <clears throat> what's worked for me is just being a team player. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that maybe that was else. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for, for jumping on um, and for answering these questions. Thank you for uh, humoring me with uh, some more difficult questions at the end. I love stopping everyone in their tracks with what's the best decade of film? Like take a second yeah. to think of that really quickly. Uh, but I, I do appreciate you coming on. Love the score for Bell. Um, it's yeah. it's a beautiful piece of work. And again, I'll link to that in the show notes. So if you're listening, you're on the fence, like listen to that score, go check out the trailer and you know, go check out the movie, like take a second to, uh, to listen and, and watch it. I said, listen to the movie, take a second to watch it. And listening is a crucial part of that. Um, but I'm, I'm really excited to see what you do next and to see Thanks. kind of your work continue. Cause again, I think you're, um, I mean, I think you're obviously incredibly talented. I've, I've only seen this from you so far. Um, and again, we were talking, uh, off camera before, and I was talking about, seeing what people do with a small amount of resources. And you mentioned like doing all of this on your MacBook, you know, in your, in your living room, like, I'm really excited to see what happens as you get, you know, more and more rope to play with uh, in the future. So um, thanks for coming on. Thanks for sharing a little bit of wisdom and hopefully everybody listening checks out bell. <laughs>